Zach, we have MK Davis, and Tony Merkel from the Confessionals will be stopping by. Uh, he wanted to come on and tell some story, uh, so I told him he's welcome to come on. So look for them coming up. Uh, Zach has a fascinating encounter when he was out hunt, uh, camping. He came across one, and many, many years later, he actually saw another one cross a road. So he'll be talking about that. Then I'll have MK come on. And if you're in the Bigfoot world, you know who, M who MK Davis is. Uh, he's a guy that always cleans up the audio and cleans up videos, and he's done a lot of cool work. Uh, so underneath this episode, I'll post some of his videos that he's done so you kind of get an idea of what we're talking about tonight. And I'll play some of that audio for you tonight, some creepy stuff, actually. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member, get additional shows, got my blog up there. Uh, so if you get a free moment, please check it out. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Zach to the show. Zach, thanks for coming on. Oh, no problem. I'm a big fan of the show and glad to get to talk to you tonight. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. I know your encounter took place back in 2005. It was in Ohio, wasn't it, Zach, where you had your encounter? Yeah, it's in a little town of uh, South Webster. It's right outside of Wayne National Forest, inside the county of Ohio. Okay. Well, sort, if you sort of on the southern side of Ohio, near the Ohio River. Gotcha. Well, if you would, would you kind of start from the beginning? Tell us what you're doing, and I know there's a uh, two encounters we want to get to, but kind of walk us into your first one, if you would. Okay. Okay, no problem. Well, me and a few buddies of mine. It was me and my buddy Eric, my buddy Brandon. Uh, we had just got off work down there at uh, Michelina's uh, food processing plant. Anyway, we uh kind of hanging around and decided we wanted to go out to camp somewhere. Well, we've been out here to Wayne National Forest. It was probably five miles from my mom's house, and uh, we met up over there. Brandon said he'd be there a little bit later. So me and Eric, we drove out there about the Wayne National Forest. We drove probably three or four miles from uh, the last county road in the Wayne National Forest and a little turnaround spot that we had actually camped a few times before but anyway uh we got there and there's always lots of shotgun shells there's always uh bullet casings where people would go up there and they'd shoot shoot guns or shoot pop bottles or broken glass so we ended up getting cleaned up and uh buddy brandon never showed up that night he was supposed to come up there and hang out with us and never did but anyway uh we got there we uh it was about dark before uh before we started making our fire, we got set up. It was late in the evening by the time we got there. We just got done working all day. But anyway, we started noticing uh, my buddy uh, Eric had a van with him. And we were actually going to lay out in the van and camp out there over the night. It's a big box van. He had uh, a couple couches set up in it, kind of a little hangout spot. This is a year after my graduation from high school, so we were still young men. But anyway, we started hearing dinging on the top of his van. You know, at first I didn't think much of it. There's acorns falling. Might have been a bird dropping something. I don't know. But anyway, we got the fire going. We were sitting around for a while. Well, we started uh, noticing the dinging it kept happening. And uh, at first it was just, you know, here and there. But then all of a sudden it was like every five or ten minutes. We started hearing something bang, uh, banging off the top of his uh, his van. And probably um, there uh, a few minutes afterwards, we um, there was two or three like pebbles hitting the top of his van. So he jumps on top of his van. He's looking up there, and he finds some gravel. And uh, the road we came in on Wayne National Forest was a gravel road most of the way, kind of half gravel, half dirt. So we thought, well, heck, man, that might have been gravel popped up there on top of his van. Because he was following me through the woods, through the uh, gravel road. Man, we'd, we'd never seen Bigfoot before. We'd never had any experiences before. You know, we've camped out there probably five or six times before that. And I've camped out there since and never had uh, anything happen. But anyway, we kind of we kind of shut it off. You know, we kind of ignore it. We uh, had like a 12-pack of beer we drank between me and him. Uh, 
we sat around the fire for a little while. We did hear some four-wheelers out in the distance kind of running around. There's a lot of four-wheeling trails, ATV trails out there that people go back and forth on. But anyway, it's about midnight, and I'd say we heard the four-wheelers probably about 9, 9 or 10 o'clock at night. That was about midnight, maybe later than that. I can't really exactly remember. But anyway, we uh, we decided to go to sleep. We uh, kind of kicked out the fire a little bit, but we kind of let it burn. Uh, maybe have a little fire to roast us some hot dogs in the morning. But anyway, we lay down in the back of the van and kind of conk out. I want to say about two hours later, we woke up, and I swear it's something. I We best ex- described it like something out of the Blair Witch Project where the campers wake up and there was all kinds of woods crashing, banging, crumbling around them. So uh, we kind of stepped out. We were kind of listening for a while and we kept hearing like something hitting the brush, like something grabbing a limb or something and like smashing it into the brush. We just kept hearing like, like someone was whacking it with a machete. Someone was whacking it with a big, uh, big log or something. Anyway, I got my spotlight out. We had a spotlight with us. We'd shine around in the woods. We started spotlighting where our camping spot was kind of up on a hill. And uh, as you're going out Wayne National Forest, it's all hills. It's all part of the Appalachian foothills. So you're either, you're either going up a hill or down a hill. Our camping spot was right flat on top of a hill. Uh, we weren't far from um, an electrical line. They had electrical cables that run through Wayne National Forest, like electric lines. But anyway, they had electrical lines running through um, not far from where we were. I bow hunted that area before, and I parked in that same spot and walked down the hill to that those uh, power lines. But anyway, we started shining the light, and uh, first I noticed these little red, uh, not red, but yellow eyes kind of looking up at us. And they were kind of looking behind the brush, big brush piles everywhere down there. And like I said, it was the end of September. There was still a lot of green left in the woods. There was still a lot of brush. I couldn't really make out what it was. It kind of looked like it was high off the ground, but I've also, uh, I've been coon hunting, trapping and hunting most of my life. And I know raccoons, they kind of got yellow, they kind of got a yellow flare to their eyes whenever you shine the light. So I kind of assumed it was a raccoon or something. It really didn't worry us too much. Well, we heard crashing on the other side of the hill. We went back over and investigated the other side. Didn't see nothing. Then we were looking around probably 10, 15 minutes, and it kind of quieted down. And all of a sudden, we heard this big crash, like boom. Like, again, something like swinging a big log into a bunch of brush. And uh, so we ran down to the other side. There was the same side, I might add, that I seen the yellow eyes. And I shined my, my spotlight down into the valley and this is all still heavily wooded and there i seen him i can't describe it anything other than bigfoot sasquatch i mean it stood there and it looked almost like um the patterson sasquatch he was more thick had thicker legs um and a z- thicker body with kind of a cone-shaped head yeah zach let me ask you real quick what now you're seeing it now you have the spotlight on it and you're actually seeing it was it in the same area where you saw the yellow eyes no, it wasn't. It, well, it was close. It was probably 25 yards from that area. It was kind of more out in the open than when I seen the yellow eyes. But when I seen this thing, it had red eyes. So I don't know if it was the same thing that had the yellow eyes. That was another one, or was that was that was the same one? So there's sometimes I've shined raccoons and stuff at night, and it seems like on uh, one end, like one angle, you'll see yellow, and you can almost move it to another angle and see a flare of red. And I've seen that before in animals, so I don't know. It might have been the same animal. It might have been I a raccoon. You. It might have been, you know, I don't know what it was. But I, I know you. for sure the second thing I shined my flashlight on with my spotlight, uh, I mean, it was a giant ape. It was black, grayish, just kind of hard to tell because it was so dark moon went out that night and it was pitch black until you turn the spotlight on and uh what else could i remember it kind of had a orangutan like hair but it didn't look like an orangutan it just had like the hair that was hanging off like its arms and like off its stomach kind of off its side a little bit there was also like big wadded balls of like matted fur like places on him it looked really dirty 
covered in mud, um, at least what I think is mud. I mean, it looked pretty grody. But anyway, well, we about crapped our pants. My buddy Eric was like, what is that? What is that? What is that? I was like, let's go. I turned the flashlight off, and we start packing up. We already had everything basically in his van. Uh, I kicked some uh, dirt over the fire to kind of put it out a little bit. And uh, we jumped in the car, and we got the heck out of there. And we probably drove 55 miles an hour down that gravel road, sliding around the curves. And, and I remember the whole time we were packing up, we were closing the back door of the van. It's like, please, God, don't let that thing come up the hill at us. You know, he never made a sound, never made a grunt. I never hear, heard any vocalizations. And I didn't actually see him moving too much. Um, and like I said, I when I shine that flashlight down there, he wasn't there 10 minutes ago. We had went on the other side of the hill. We were shining down. We heard that crash, and we came back. He was probably 15, 20 yards from that where that where that yellow eyes was. And uh, boom, there he was, man. And I only got a few glimpses of him because he scared the crap out of me. Yeah, and I didn't mean to rudely cut you off earlier when you were describing it. Would you describe for the audience, let's say someone who doesn't know – uh, they don't know what Bigfoot is. They don't know what Sasquatch means when you say that to them. How would you describe to them what you saw? And was there any details that you remember? Well, it was tall. And it was hard to tell because I was looking up down, like up from a hill. And he was sort of at the bottom of the hill. And it was sort of a long, steep incline down the hill. Um, I would say it was human-like, tall. Uh, didn't exactly look like a human, like a cross between a gorilla and a human. Um Except for the orangutan hair, kind of threw me off. I mean, it was a big, horrible thing. I don't mean it's the best way I could describe it. And he I was mean, just kind of eyes shined in the light. And he was just looking up at you guys. He didn't make any move towards you guys. He didn't growl or show his teeth or anything. He was just, was it just kind of a stare off? I didn't. See, I didn't see any teeth. Now I noticed he did have sort of the flat looking nose, and um, I really couldn't see any nostrils. But you kind of got to imagine, you, you're looking at a deer, or you're looking at somebody through a spotlight, um, parts of him shy it up and parts of him behind him won't. So the key features I saw was like his chest. Like that's where I no mainly noticed like a lot of the matted, uh, matted balls of fur was around his chest. And as it went down, um, you started noticing the long fur that was hanging off of him. Him or her, I don't know what it was. I mean, I noticed in the Patterson film, it appears that Bigfoot has um, the breasts in that film, but I didn't notice anything, you know, like sticking out from its chest that would lead me to believe that it was a female Bigfoot. And was, did the expression change at all when you hit it with the light, or was it mainly just kind of a stone face looking at you? Well, I noticed its eyes kind of squinted a little bit, but they didn't close all the way like B and you would. Like, you'd almost close your eyes, someone's throwing a spotlight in your face. And almost like it kept its eyes open, but you can you can see the glare, like the, the, the gleam out of his eyes. And it was kind of hard to tell if he had his eyes wide open or he had them squinting. Yeah, the red eyes kind of make it worse, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> I can't think of a worse color yeah, for something like this thing to have besides red eyes. You know what I mean? It's just your stereotypical, uh, almost like horror film. Obviously, it's going to have red eyes. And you, and you hear a lot of reports of them with the red eyes. Was was the eye shine from your spotlight or was it giving off a yeah. glow? No, it wasn't glowing. It was completely pitch black. You turned the light off. Nothing was glowing. It neither was the yellow eyes. It was the glare off my uh, spotlight. Because the spotlight I was using was like, on like a thousand looms or something ridiculous like that. I mean, I could cross the field and see a deer at the end of the field. I mean, it's got a good brightness to it. What but no, the, the eyes didn't glow in the night. Uh, it was more of a gleam. Off of uh, off the light, off the spotlight. Off the light, yeah. I wanted to ask you, what what do you think was going on there? I mean, they do weird stuff like this to where it's like they'll make noise over here, try and draw your attention over here. And I say like idiots, but I, I've been in the same position you were in. Like idiots, like humans, we'll go and look over what's going on over here. So we'll get up and walk over to another direction. Um, and I've uh, they've done it to me. And like an idiot, I'll go in the direction of the sound. But what do you think was actually going on there? 
when you heard the sound on the other side of the hill, then coming back, you know what I mean? Well, at first it kind of felt aggressive. Um, they obviously were making a lot of racket around us in each different direction. Now, I don't know if that was the same one. It was one making those different sounds, but it seemed like it was coming from north, south, east, north, south, east, you know, and then all the, um, all the action happened what was on the east end of our camping spot. I thought they may have been traveling through. I think I've been thinking about this a lot since 2005. And I think if, if these creatures have been around for this long, then they're no very nomadic. They're very secretive. Um, they don't stay in one spot for very long. They probably travel quite a bit. They probably travel long distances. I think maybe they were traveling through because then, like I said, I've camped in that spot before and I've camped in it since actually going out there trying to, you know, reenact what happened that night, trying to figure out if we were just seeing things or, you know, if, if we can reenact and get another Bigfoot to, 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 to follow us, to talk, you know, to give us some kind of communication or sign. And, uh, it just never worked out, but I thought maybe they were traveling through nomadic and just curious about us. It seemed aggressive, but like I've heard you say in your podcast before, if, if it wanted us, it would have got us. I mean, it was just me and my buddy out there. We were just sitting around the fire. I mean, if it wanted us dead, if it wanted to eat us, I'm sure it would have us. Yeah, I tend to agree. I tend to agree with you. Uh, what was the conversation like? You guys are now speeding down the road. I would imagine sliding all over the place. Uh, maybe when things calmed down, what what was the conversation you and your friend had? Well, we got back to my house that night. I want to say this is probably 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, probably only an hour or two, uh, maybe an hour, a little bit longer than that till daylight. And we stayed up the rest of the morning. I think we uh, sat there at the my mom's uh, dining room table, and we just kind of stared off. And like, what the heck was that? What happened? And I, know, and I remember, like, long periods of silence. But uh, it seemed like the next day... Once we went to sleep, we went to sleep. He fell asleep on the couch. I went to my bedroom, went to sleep. But the next day and the days after, we told this story to a few people. Uh, not a lot. People think you're crazy. You know, you tell them Bigfoot stories. You're seeing Bigfoot out in the woods. I mean, it's just, it's true. A lot of people do think it's crazy. I've gotten ridicule for it. Uh, just like my second encounter, I, you know, I went into work and, I told him, hey, I think I've seen something crazy walking across the road this morning, like a Sasquatch, and, uh, you know, they just thought I was nuts. <laughs> yeah, well, let's but, talk uh, Let's we, talk about your second encounter. I, I, I agree with you, Zach. I think, as you and I were talking earlier, it's all fun and games until it happens to you. Then when it happens to you, all of a sudden, it's not oh, funny yeah. anymore. And that's a lot of people, you know, they, they joke, they smirk, you know, they give you the raised eyebrow. Well, it's all fun and games until it happens to you. And then when it happens to you, it's not so funny anymore. Um, I, I don't know what the Sasquatch is doing. It sounds like it was just kind of curious. You guys had the high ground. You never attacked the high ground. Yeah. I think these things are smart enough to know that. Even though, like oh, you said cool. earlier, they could come through and kill everyone. No one's going to stop it. But, and but, like I told you in the beginning, like all the gun shells, like the shotgun shells, all the rifle bullets, all the broken glass. I mean... Bigfoot's traveling through there. Know that people come out to that spot. They shoot the loud guns. They shoot the boomsticks, whatever they want to think they are. They know that guns are bad. I do believe that. Uh, and it just that kind of threw me off, too. Like, why would he be curious about us? I mean, why wouldn't he think that we were armed? Because we could have been armed. I mean, we weren't armed that night, but we could have been armed. And I'm sure the Bigfoot knows what a gun is. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that guns bother them as much as people think. I don't think you're going to scare them off with gunfire. And I've talked to a lot of people who've yeah. had these things on their property, and they go out, they fire off shots. And what you'll find is 90% of the time it doesn't scare off these things. They tend to stick around. Um, so I think that I, – I don't know that guns really terrify these things. I think if you're in the woods, you come across one, you reach for a gun, you, you hear it. Time and time again with encounters, it's almost like they know what that gun does, and they start acting like Mike Woolley's encounter. I mean, Mike's sitting there in a tree stand, and he comes across two of them, and the moment he kind of points a gun at one of them, all of a sudden it starts freaking out. So I, I think that they know what those guns are. I don't know that they're so terrified of them like most people think. You know, you fire off a gun in the woods, 
And any prey or even predator within a mile is going to head the opposite direction from where that gunshot goes off. They are out of there. Oh, definitely. Uh, these things, on the other hand, I, I, I don't know that I feel that way. I don't know that they run run so quick when someone fires off a gun. Uh, but tell me about your second encounter, if you would. You kind of alluded to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's not as juicy as the first one. That first one made me a Bigfoot believer. Uh, this second one... Um, was kind of reaffirmed uh, like i told you earlier when i was talking to you on the phone uh i'm a big hunter trapper fisherman i've been in the woods everywhere i mean i've been all over way national forest little miami river i've been around like we're real close to the east fork area and i've been around east fork quite a bit i know on the bfro uh, uh, website there's actually a few reports on east fork lake um about bigfoot's throwing boulders into the water which i have a little little comment I want to make about that. But to get to my encounter, um, I was driving to work. I work downtown Cincinnati, but I live out here in Claremont County, Brown County line. Uh, I'm out here in the farmland. There's nothing but, I'm looking out my front porch now and I see nothing but soybeans. <laughs> soybeans and barns, as far as the eye can see. And uh, I was driving to work. There's not a lot of woods. It's four o'clock in the morning. I drive past the golf course, which is probably five or six miles from my house. It's on my way home. Well, I'm driving down the road. I got my headlights on and I got the, uh, the brights on it's four o'clock. I see something cross the road. It almost looked like it just took one step, like sort of like a long leap into the center of the road and then leaped over the handrail into the creek on the other side. So he was coming from the golf course. So there was a golf course on the left side of the road. There's a tree line on the left side of the road that separates, gives the golf course privacy from the road. And he was in those tree lines and he stepped sort of the center line of the road, which this was a one lane road, you know, kind of a two lane road. There's actually not any lines in the middle of the road. He kind of got a, um, turn over a little bit when you got a big truck coming through ahead of you but anyway took one step like it was almost like one two three he was right over the rail and into the creek and uh there's probably i don't know like a 10 or 15 foot drop there because it's kind of going through some rolling hills and that golf course is really hilly so he was walking kind of sideways and the road was going up the hill, so he was walking sideways from the left to the right into the creek from the golf course. And I didn't really get a real good view of him. He was probably at the edge of my headlights when I was driving through, but he didn't look anything like my first Bigfoot I encountered. This thing was tall and linky. And I could kind of see, like, I don't know if he was wearing, it didn't seem like he had a lot of fur, like the first Bigfoot. Like the first Bigfoot I saw, it had like the orangutan kind of hanging down fur. He had the mats on him. I mean, he was kind of a furry guy. He was a big, broad, wide-chested thing. But this thing was just tall and slender, like real skinny and linky looking, and just hopped right across the road. As far as I could see, he looked like it was black, maybe grayish black. I'm not really sure, but it was a dark collar, definitely. And it was kind of hard to tell in the, in the dark exactly what he looked like. I didn't get a good view of the face. I didn't get a good view of like really the front of him, more of like the side of it, either it'd be a male or female. And was the first one, was it, you said the, the second one was tall and skinny. What was the first one? Was it built bigger than this one that you'd just seen? Yeah. Like I mentioned, it was more like the Patterson big, but like I had like the, the big wide shoulders. It kind of had a barrel chest and then it came down. I kind of had thick wide legs. It's kind of hard to exactly see the, his body type between his fur. Because this thing was actually pretty furry, except for, like, right on the face, around the eyes and the nose. I didn't see as much fur. And uh, I didn't notice a cone head on the second one. And I didn't, didn't really get to see its face too well. But, uh, yeah, the first one I saw was a big stocky thing. This thing was, like, slender, linky looking is the best way I can describe it. And I remember going to work, and uh, t that same morning, I told a coworker, I said, man, I see something strange on the way in, something crazy. He's like, what is it? And I'm like, well, uh, I think I've seen a Bigfoot. And he kind of laughed. Everybody laughed. You know, I told a couple guys there at work, I'm like, man, I think I've seen something crazy this morning. I was just so shocked by it. And I'm just driving to work like I do every other day, Monday through Friday, 
you know, the thousand times I've driven to work and it just, bam, pops out of nowhere, run right out in front of me. And I, like I said, I hadn't seen nothing since the 2005 incident. Uh, and then here at the 20, what was that? 2017 incident. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's um, a lot of times when people see these things, you know, they have different descriptions. Sometimes people will say uh, they, you know, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, just this huge mu muscle bound monster. Um, and then other times you'll talk to people and they say, no, it was like a, like I think you and you and I were talking earlier. You said it was more like a tall basketball player. And I hear that a lot more than you would think, you know, where a lot of times people run into these things and they're not King Kong. It's more of a tall basketball player, kind of linky, kind of skinny, still big, still probably bigger than you are, but um, yeah. not quite the monster that some people respond, you know, when they'll say it, it was King Kong, I saw King Kong coming, you know, coming at me. Um, so it's fascinating when you hear about the different, different body types. And I realize this is more of like a one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000 view of this thing. Uh, but it's still shocking yeah. nonetheless. You know what I mean? It still shocks you when you see it. I mean, yeah, I've, like I said, I've lived out in the country my whole life. I've seen everything from deer, raccoons, coyotes, possums, skunks, you name it. I've seen it across the road. I've never seen nothing like this cross the road. <laughs> it just blew my mind. And just remembering back, being a believer from my uh, 2005 experience, uh, I know it's got me interested. I know there's a few Bigfoot groups in my area. I hadn't tried to contact any of them. I hadn't tried to tell my story. I hadn't tried. I hadn't told uh, the BFRO, even though there is some reports on the BFRO in my area, mainly the East Fork area which is a large lake in, uh, in this part of the woods. I know you've been a hunter your whole life. Did this affect you afterwards? I mean, do you still go out hunting, or did you kind of put the kibosh on the whole thing? Well, I've been hunting and trapping for a long time, and I still go. <laughs> now, I definitely watch my back in the woods. Uh, yeah, I'm not too – I mean, it scared the crap out of me, Wes, to be honest with you. I mean, that's something that you always remember, and I'm sure you know that with your experiences. But uh, I wasn't going to let let it stop me because the outdoors and the wildlife and the wilderness have been so so much a big part of my life. I wasn't going to let me, let it stop me from going in the woods. But you know, I had my eye on my show over my shoulder. <laughs> oh yeah, you're you're on high alert, aren't you? When you go out there, you're like on oh, high definitely. alert. I'll be out there deer hunting and, and I'll hear a squirrel coming. I was like, I know it's a squirrel, but maybe not. You know, and I kind of, I keep my eyes peeled, but you know, I've hunted a lot and trapped a lot over the years and never saw a thing, never had a weird encounter, nothing like that. Uh, it was just the one camping trip and then going to work one morning, I had an encounter. Yeah, that's usually the way it happens. That's definitely the way it happens. And I know you've been looking into this for a long time. What What do you think Sasquatch is? You hear me ask people that on the show all the time. And uh, Zach, you know there's no wrong answer. I mean, no one really knows yeah. anyway. But what's your own opinion? I think it has to be, I mean, depends on what your religious beliefs are, I guess. But I tend to be uh, more, I believe in evolution, whether you believe that it's you know, how God created or why God created. But anyway, um, I believe that we had a common ancestor with these things at one time. Uh, they've evolved their way. We've evolved our way. They've learned the world. They've learned the earth. They've learned the wilderness. And we learned through industry and technology. And these creatures have survived this long I'm sure watching us kill each other for generations and generations, and they've probably shared the knowledge through generations and generations. Um, they have to be a relative of human. If they're not paranormal, then they have to be a relative of human, just in my opinion, mind you, a relative of human from early human that's, that's still hiding and creeping around here to this day. And, and you know, I think about that question a hundred thousand times since I've seen Bigfoot. Like, how in the world does something like that exist on this planet? But then you have the sighting and you see it. And it's not just a guy in a monkey costume. It's not something that's just, that's not real. It's there right in front of you. Like, how do you explain a creature like that in our modern world? They would have to be of a vast intelligence. I'm not, not saying like intelligence like we have. I don't know. Don't, they don't have Wi-Fi in a cave somewhere. But 
but um, they have to be intelligent. They're just intelligent in different ways than we are, like with the Earth, more akin with the Earth, with the the way the world works, the way plants grow. I don't. I mean, that's just my opinion on. Yeah, and I don't necessarily disagree with you. How did you come to that? What makes you think that they are an offspring of human? What What makes you feel that way? Because it was definitely some part human when I looked down at it. Looked down at it. I mean, it didn't look like a pure ape. I mean, I, I don't know of any other gorillas or ape that are capable of some of the things you hear from these Sasquatch stories and what I've seen myself. And like I told you, I believe in evolution, man. I mean, I believe that we came from apes. We were we were monkeys. We were, you know, we were apes that lived in the forest, and we rose up, and we became humans. And I believe that, uh, you know, there was other species of man, like the Neanderthal. Uh, they found another species. They na- nicknamed the hobbits, the tiny species. Uh, I mean, we found evidence of not just Cro-Magnum, our species of humans, but other species as well that lived and died. But who's to say that some of them didn't die? You know, I know some people say, well, they could have interbreed with us and we could have came one race. That's possible. There is a lot of proof that Neanderthal is bred with us, that, you know, a lot of Europeans share Neanderthal DNA. But there was obviously other creatures that evolved alongside of us that learned different ways, that survived different ways than we did. And that's what the Bigfoot are. <laughs> I mean, that's just one of my opinions. Yeah, you know, I don't no, know. I appreciate like, sharing like it. Like yeah. you said before, like, sorry to interrupt you, but I don't have one in the garage. I'm not studying it, you know what I mean? I mean, I have no clue what these are, but that's just kind of one theory I had. Yeah, no, and I appreciate sharing your theory. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I can, so you think they're kind of the, the in-between? Because, you know, the argument with evolution, if we came from monkeys, where's the in-between? So you're kind of thinking they're yeah. the in-between. Well, they kind of branched off. I mean, they might not be in between anymore. They branched off from us just like the um, chimpanzees did, just like Neanderthals did. They had their own branch of their tree, and our branch obviously kept growing and growing and growing. Other branches merged into our branch, and it kept growing. So we had this offshoot of our species that obviously could be these wild men, these Sasquatches, these Bigfoots. And they kind of branched off on their own. I mean, they obviously developed quite an intelligence to be able to evade us for this long. We don't have a body. We don't have any solid evidence of the existence of Bigfoot. Now, the government might, you know, there might be a government in another country that has a frozen one somewhere. But we don't have any proof of these animals. So these animals are clever enough and intelligent enough to evade us and not just to evade our government and our soldiers, but just everyday citizens, like people that walk the field, people like me that run my trap line down the creek, that go hunting in the fields, you know, people that go four-wheeling through the woods and Wayne National Forest. I mean, it's a constant everyday struggle for them to hide from us, unless it's paranormal and they disappear. You know? <laughs> yeah, That's no, possible, I too. I don't know. Don't you find it odd, though, we haven't been able to catch up with them? They, let's say, let's put the United States aside. They're in China, they're in Russia, they're in Australia, they're everywhere. Uh, there's reports of them in every, almost every continent. Don't you find that a little odd that no one's been able to catch up with these things? Like no one has actually dragged one out of the forest and been like, here you go, here's what I ran into, here's what I shot. Don't you think someone at this point would have done that by now? I believe it has happened. I believe, uh, like I know you've gone over in some of your episodes before, talk about the government. You know, you always heard these stories of the men in black showing up at your house. You know, excuse me, babe, if we heard you saw a UFO. But anyway, uh, I believe that could be entirely possible. There could have been people that shot Bigfoot or have killed one, had one in their back, back of their truck. And it all got covered up by the government. I mean, or no one's ever shot one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, hard I have to no say, clue, isn't man. it? I've been thinking about this since 2005. I mean, it just completely boggles my mind how these creatures seem to have to evade human detection, and how we over what since uh, the Patterson film, the whole you know the whole world's been talking about Sasquatch. I know there were stories about that. It was highly popularized after the Patterson stuff went on, 
And uh just seems like there's lots of Sasquatch hunters. And there's just today, there's tons of Sasquatch hunting groups. I mean, you look on Facebook, you look on the YouTube. I mean, there are so many different groups across this country and across the world. Nobody has come up with solid evidence. What is going on? Yeah, it makes you think, doesn't it? Makes you wonder a little bit. Oh, every day makes me wonder. It just boggles my mind that us as human beings, we went to the moon. <laughs> you know, we've been yeah. in space. We've been to the bottom of the ocean, and we have a an ape, a human hybrid, uh, a creature, a monster that that walks through American backyards and through the forests and through our state parks. I know a lot about Salt Fork State Park up here in Ohio, and you look on the BFRO, there's probably 10 or more stories about Salt Fork. Salt Fork's a big park, but man, there's a lot of hikers there. There's a lot of kayakers, boaters, you know, beach goers, campers, I mean, everything. All those people in the woods all the time, and we still don't have evidence of Bigfoot. Yeah, it's frustrating. But I know what I saw. Do you, do you and your friends still talk about it? The one that the 2005 incident and did it affect him in, in well, any way? Well, I've kind of lost contact with him. He kind of uh, kind of went downhill and he got strung out on drugs. And I kind of, you know, I have a family, a wife, and kid, and I kind of got away with hanging out with him. He wasn't the he's not the same person now like he, he was back then. But. um do you but think? Yeah, do you think the incident after that happened? Do you, Do you think the incident well, affected it? him being on drugs? Do you think that kind of caused him to fall off the deep end? The incident that you guys had, or do you think it was something separate? I mean, it could have very well been, but he it seemed like a uh, well. That was two thousand five. He didn't get start. He start didn't start on the drugs too bad. About two thousand eight, two thousand nine. That's really the last time I started hanging out with him. I think it was like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. And, you know, he held a job for years, and you know, he was doing real good. And um, I think he's actually reading now. He's off or something. But I'm um, friends with him on Facebook. I don't ever say anything to him, though. We don't ever talk. I kind of stay away from him a little bit. Yeah. I no, think I guess understand. it could have had a little bit a, a contributing factor to his addiction. Some people handle it differently, man. I, I've talked to, like I've said on the show in the past, I've talked to a lot of alcoholics off the air. And uh, I'll ask them, do you think it's directly related to this? And they'll say, absolutely. You know, it's uh, yeah. people cope with things in a different way. You know, some people drink it away and it eventually comes out. It eventually will cut, rear its ugly head. No matter how much you try and bury an encounter with these things, it'll eventually come out. Whether it's drinking, drugs, uh, you'll find some way to cope with it in a negative way. And I think that's why it's good to talk about it. You know, good to talk about what happened, what you saw, and and not feel like someone's going to beat you up. You know what I mean? You're the first one I've talked to in years that didn't think I was a joke. I mean, I'm married, and I tell my wife this story. And she, does, but she, does, she claims she believes me, but, you know, there's always that people, you don't know if anybody's really taking you seriously when you're talking about this subject. But you definitely seem like uh, you're easy to talk to, and uh, you know your stuff. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate I'm honored you come on and talk about it. I think it's fascinating encounters. Thank God that first, I'm so thankful that first one didn't seem like he was really interested in you one way or another. If he's going to stand down there, you're going to shine a light on him. He's going to just sit there and look up at you. Uh, it seems like he really wasn't looking for a fight. He wasn't looking for anything. He just kind of stumbled out into the open and you guys were able to get a, get a good look at him. Um, and thank God for that. You know what I mean? Because that could have gone south pretty quick. Oh, I know. The whole time we were packing up, I was thinking to myself, please, God, not, don't let that thing come up the hill. And it's almost like like you mentioned how it just stood there and stared at me. You ever seen a deer in a headlight? Yeah, of course. Down the road? I'm yeah. sure you do there in Washington. And they freeze. They yep. freeze and they stare at you. And you got to honk your horn to get them out of the way. Um, that might have been what was happening, man. I might have signed that down, light down on him. He might have been walking up the hill, and he just stopped. He got blinded, and he stopped. And uh, I turned the light off, and we got the hell out. Yeah, you kind of broke up there. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm glad that it didn't go south on you, uh, because sometimes they do.
on the outside edge of a building, and the building was a type of a tractor shed. And uh, and this tractor shed uh, in this area right here was frequently visited by an alleged uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot. The the scene is out across this field to a, a, a little patch of woods where they thought would be a likely place that uh, that this Sasquatch would appear. Uh, as it did occur, the Sasquatch came from the blind side and actually entered into this shed, this tractor shed, and begins to uh, to make uh, some vocals and audio uh, that's picked up quite well by the camera. I'm going to amplify it here so you can hear it better. But uh, let's listen to it and remember that uh, in, in, in this particular case, uh, these Bigfoot or Sasquatch have demonstrated to be excellent mimics uh, as, as uh, they actually, you know, it sounds that, that they heard people make, they would, they would sort of uh, repeat them uh, much the same way like a parrot would, uh, and sometimes over and over and over uh, as they learned them. And and if if that's the case, you know, uh, like I said, this is a this is something that's uh, that's new, novel, and interesting. And uh, listen to it, see what you think. Uh, if you think it's a Sasquatch, or could be a Sasquatch, um, this is an area where they were alleged to inhabit and in, in a place where they were uh, sort of concentrated by uh, habituation attempts. So, let's listen. Well, there you have it. Um, this is occurring, in, like I said, inside of a tractor shed, and it's the same shed that you see in the video Tractor Guy. Uh, and is this the same fellow you see in the video Tractor Guy? I don't know. Could be. Uh, the voice sure sounds big and deep. Um, is it a Sasquatch? There again, can't see it. But the audio is very interesting. What do you think? Anyway, I thank you for your time. Well, next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, M.K. Davis. And if you're a part of the uh, Bigfoot world, you know who M.K. is. Uh, he does great work on videos, and he always cleans up videos. Actually, M.K.'s posted some of the most amazing videos I've ever seen uh, when it comes to Sasquatch. Uh, and I'm glad to have you on, M.K. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. 
Well, thanks for having me on, Wes. Yeah, Glad no, to be here. Yeah, it's a huge honor for me to have you on. Um, I want to kind of start out, you know, I've always wanted to ask you, I know we are just talking before we went on the air, uh, before we get to some of these, you know, like the white Bigfoot, the pictures I posted up on the blog that you took, um, and some of the other videos that you've done, uh, for the audience out there, uh, MK, what got you interested into Bigfoot? I know you've had encounters too as well, and would you mind talking about some of your encounters? Well, I just got interested in the Bigfoot phenomenon uh, through the Patterson film. Uh, I was into astrophotography. I was taking space photos through my telescope, and it requires some specialized type of type of processing. And, and it was back in those days, it was in film. And I came across a couple of frames from the Patterson film that had been treated much the same way as you would a space photograph. You know, they'd been filtered to to uh, remove chromatic aberration and boost contrast and things that you would do to a space photo. And it caught my interest, and uh, I, I could see that these were really high quality frames. And you can't really get a, anything good out of a bad film. And like a uh, you know, like so many people, I'd seen the film in theaters and, and on TV, and it was shaking all over the place, and, and you got a kind of a good look, but, but it was still not steady. And, and so I, I thought to myself, well, there must be a better version of the film out there somewhere for these two frames to even exist. Yeah. And uh, I began an inquiry. And uh, it led me uh, down a path, uh, you know, it's like so many things do. Uh, one thing leads to another, and I think I thought that the film, if it, if I got near the master and I got enough good frames, that it would tell its own story. And I think that it has. It has. If you've seen some of my my stuff there on my blog site, uh, this is uh, new processing that has really, really benefited this film. It was developed for to solve some of the problems that were. Uh, technical problems that were the film had, and and it did so beautifully. And you can see uh, with a great deal of accuracy uh, what those two men saw, and that makes a huge difference when you're trying to make a judgment whether you're whether you're going to buy into something or not. Uh, and I hope this really gives the film a boost uh, and uh, sends it on sends it on its way uh, to acceptance. Yeah, and you do do a lot of work. You have cleaned up the. I have seen a lot of your work. Um, and for the audience out there, check out the Davis Report dot WordPress dot com, uh, which is MK's site, and you can read his blog and check out some of the videos he's done. Uh, MK, tell tell me about your first encounter, if you would, for the audience. What were you doing, and and just kind of walk us into what happened, if you would. Well, I've had two encounters at Bluff Creek. One in Louisiana, and this is this is uh, uh, in addition to the white one there that I posted uh, that's on your blog. The the first time that I went to Bluff Creek and uh, I saw one, uh, it, it it was uh, we had walked in with a friend. I had walked in with a friend, and we had walked about a little over two miles up from the bridge and uh, upstream, and we were right there at the Patterson site, film site, and. I had seen a rock stack. It was three rocks. Uh, you know, one, two, three. The, the top one was small, but the other two were quite large. And uh, I could see where the rocks had been pulled out of the creek bed, and it was so fresh that there was wet sand on them. So I knew that whoever did that, or whatever did it, was still around close, thinking they had time to go. We were going to film a little bit. It was We were kind of pushed for time, and my friend was setting up his video camera and all of a sudden off to my right there was a, a whack uh i guess what you call a tree uh tree knock uh you could hear the reverb you know on the wood uh, the stick of wood it was green because i could tell it was green because it had a ringing sound i couldn't see through the, the undergrowth that had grown up on the sandbar and i just kind of got underneath it and looked and i got glimpses of it walking along the hillside. And my friend says he thinks maybe he might have gotten the audio. He said he could hear some mumbling. I, I couldn't hear it because I've spent a lot of time around heavy 
uh, machinery, and I just don't hear that well anymore. But that was my first one, and and as a matter of fact, I I took that my photo of that rock stack, and I uh, and I just jacked up the contrast on it, and you can see the, the life lines in the palm of the hand across the top of that rock, and that, in that sand matrix. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting yeah, to hear about yeah, them yeah. doing rock stacks, and I've never seen, I guess, what people call rock stacks. I have seen structures, but uh, you do hear of them doing that. That's very interesting. So it was kind of off in the distance, and you were just getting glimpses of it leaving. Right, right. Uh, it, it really wasn't that far, but it was uh, a lot of stuff to look through, you know, uh, the brush and everything, uh, which is typical, you know, for Sasquatch. Uh, encounters and for the video that people get it it's the patterson film is it's the exception rather than the rule being you know in the yeah, open like that i tend to agree and that your second encounter i want to hear about the one in louisiana but your second encounter was at the patterson site too the same uh different time uh, yeah yeah it was in 2008 uh, i went to the patterson site three times that year the, the first time we had seen a, a whole bunch of, of broken trees out there on the sandbar itself in a circle. And these were, were you know, three, four-inch trees that were snapped off. One of them had been so much pressure on the tree straight down that it, it split. And, and that was really fresh, too. Uh, I think this was in August. And... There were a lot of fires at the time, and, and, and we eventually had to leave because the fires uh, came back in October. We went, we went to the same place, and I looked down in the water, and there was what appeared to be a fetus. It looked like a fetus to me. It had these little limbs, appendages on it, on that long-looking umbilical thing. It was laying in the water. We picked it up, put it in a plastic bag, but it eventually ruined, you know, because of the heat. And and uh, and, and my, my friend uh, Don Monroe threw it away. We went up the mountain, and this when we talk about going up this mountain, it was like a forty-five degree slope. You know, you could put your hands out and touch the ground in front of you. You know, it's uh, we made our way on up. It took a while. It was a ravine off to our left. And uh, Don Monroe had actually fallen into that ravine a couple of years earlier. So, you know, we had to watch our real, ourselves real close that didn't get to slide. Uh, so we made it up there, and we came across these culverts, these uh, pretty large culverts uh, that were laying half buried down on the mountainside. And some of them had been bent, bent around uh, trees and stuff. They had fallen from up the top. And and these must be they must be the same culverts that the 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 story says that the Bigfoot picked up culverts and threw them down the mountain. They must be those culverts uh, because culverts are quite valuable, and I can't see anybody just chunking them. Uh, they roll down, and some of them are quite long and just folded around trees and stuff. And my friend Don went in one of them. I don't know how he got up the nerve to do that, but he went quite a ways up in that culvert. So uh, as we we went, made our way on up to the top, we, well, I say the top, we didn't go to the top of the mountain, but we found a, an old road that was came down to Bluff Creek, down to the creek itself. It was no longer usable all the way down. We stopped there and ate a bite. And I walked, went to kind of circling around because uh, I was interested in what was out there. And I kind of went through these little curtain of vegetation. And I was in this, it was like a, a, a little Shangri-La. I mean, it was just beautiful. It, it was level flat, even though we were on that steep mountainside. It, it had ferns growing. Uh, it, it was, uh, had a waterfall that came through, uh, and it had a deer carcass in there and the bones had been snapped and the marrow 
sucked out, and there were big tracks all around it. I call that the lair, and I have been wanting to get back there ever since. It's it's a difficult climb to get up there, and I, I made a couple of attempts and weren't able to finish up. So I, gotcha. I have not been back since that day in 2008. I have not made it back to that lair. What, what did this one? Of, let me ask you, MK, I apologize for cutting you off. What did the fetus look like? Was it humanoid? Is that what, what? well it was it had little appendages on it. Uh I'll send you a picture if you want, Wes. Uh, I took I, yeah, I, please I took do. Document. I got film in but still photos. Would it be okay if I post that up to the blog, MK? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I try to document document everything, you know, when I go to a place like that because it's a, it's such a an effort to get there in the first place. You know, I, I make sure that uh, I don't leave too much up to my memory. Yeah, I've always uh, wanted to see that film site, and Bob's always telling me, "Oh, come on, we'll go." You know, we'll uh, we'll do it on a weekend. I'll take you up there and. Uh, I've always wanted to go and see it. Obviously, it looks nothing like what you see in the film today. I mean, it looks like two different places well, because of overgrowth. The, and... lay of the, the lay of the land looks the same. It, it's the it's the growth. Uh, you kind of have to remember that in 1967, it was only uh, three years after a 500-year flood had come through there in 64. And that had swept that whole creek basin out uh, and cleaned it, uh, stripped it. It was it was a violent flood that it took a big chunk of the mountain out down there at Highway 96. So they had to rebuild the bridge. Uh, yeah, it so, looks you know, it, it looks like that when had, you see it in the film. I mean, yeah. it looks like a major flood came through and just wiped everything out. When you if you look around Patty, everything looks like a disaster just came through there. Yeah, a lot of flotsam and jetsam, they call it. It was just laying everywhere. But they, that's what they, the logging they were doing in there was not typical logging. It was to take that bad stuff out of there. You know, get that stream clear where it would, would flow good. Well, let me ask you, uh, let's get to the uh, Louisiana one. I don't mean to rush it, but let's get to the Louisiana one, and then I want to get down to business. I got a lot of questions for you on some of these videos. Yeah, stuff I've always wanted to ask you. And I and I appreciate your time, MK. Thank you for again. Thank you for coming on. I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. Um, I think you do cool work. I think you. It's like you you're able to polish turds. I, I don't know how else to put it. Like uh, you'll see a video that you had before, and then when you get in there and clean it up, it it the, it's some of the best films I've ever seen. Um, like the mirror. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. Where the lady was filming with the mirrors. And it looks like two gorillas are, are wrestling in her yard. But before we get to that, tell tell us about the Louisiana encounter, if you would. Well, this this occurred about the year 2000 or 2001. I forgot what year it was, but it was around then. And it, it was, it was uh, I was out there with the GCBRO. Uh, they're a pro-kill group. I was uh, keeping the fire warm. And I heard a shot. And... Then I heard the radio. The radio says, I got one. And uh, then someone else says, well, shoot it again. He said, I don't have to. It's dead. It wasn't dead. It got away. And they wanted lights. So I was at the camp, so I loaded lights in my truck. A couple of guys were with me. They were in the back, and I had one up front with me. And I was going down this field road to bring them the lights and it came across it was it was the strangest looking thing it it, it came across right in front of the truck not 15 yards in front of my truck at, at running for its life i mean just wide open and and it was down low uh and i had I, it was an odd looking way to run it kept bringing its back legs up way out of by its head and then stretching and pulling and it had an oval shaped head uh, uh really odd oval shaped head uh long the feet back feet were long and thin at the heel In my mind you know i, I said there's no match found it, it wasn't patty 
uh, and it wasn't real large. It was about maybe a hundred pounds, but, but, you know, it, it must have been associated with the shooting down there because it was running for its life. And, you know, it was all the shoot, the shooting occurred down in a, in a bottom creek bottom. And I was nowhere near there yet. I was still up in the, in the hilly areas, but it must have ran out of there and came toward me. You know, um, I, I really don't know what to say or think about that. I, I don't know that it was Bigfoot per se. And when, uh, you, when you say that, what do you mean? You don't know that it well, was it Bigfoot. Just, it, it didn't look classically like like Patty. I gotcha. It it, it looked more like. Uh, uh, for lack of a better word, it looked like a giant rabbit. It didn't have long ears, but the way it ran, it ran like a rabbit. Like a rat, you uh, said, you know, okay? Like a rat, like a rabbit. It, it, it brought it. Oh, rabbit. Brought its back legs up, and then it stretched way out, and it was so smooth that it never, it never did any up and down. It just went zipped across there, and then about the last. Ten feet before going into the wood line, it 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 leaked. I got you. So it was uh, on. All, it was basically on all fours, is what you're saying. And right, right, like it was a on rabbit. all fours and staying below the level of the grass. The grass was tall. Uh, I would have never seen it at all if if I weren't on a road. You know that the grass was beat down and it crossed the road from the truck right in front of the headlights, right on it. My first reaction to that one was that I, I, I looked over to my friend there was on the side, on sitting beside. I said he was turned around talking to the people in the back. I said, "Did you see that?" And and as it turned out, he did turn around in time to see it leap into the wood line. Uh, because I was really really afraid that I was the only one that saw it, and you know that's a, a helpless feeling if you're the only one. And you don't have it recorded, you know. Then, yeah. then you have a you have a story that people may or may not believe, you know. And so, uh, what ha- what happens next? Did those guys get out of there? The GCR or GCBRO guys, like Jim's La- Jim Lansdale and his team. I don't care what anyone says; those guys got big brass balls of steel, man. Um, they will go out there. I know. I realize you see Killing Bigfoot or whatever the name of the TV show is, and it seems like it's all you know, uh, theatrics, but those guys do go out there and do that. I've talked to those guys off the air and they got big brass balls of steel, man. They will go out there and, uh, what worries me at doing something like that, MK, and I don't know how you feel about this, but it always seems like there's a revenge streak in these creatures. You start popping off shots and all of a sudden they're going to make you pay. Uh, I can name off many incidents, uh, to where they do. That could very well could be true. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with, the unknown, so uh, you don't really know how it will turn out. You know, uh, the the big the I, I think back in those days, especially, uh, there was a lot less thought about uh, maybe perhaps shooting one. There was quite a number of people that were pro kill. Uh, you know, John Green was pro kill. Grover Prince was pro kill. You know, those were some of the you know icons of the Bigfoot. You know, they they just generally thought that it was the right thing to do to get a discovery, but right, it's fraught it's fraught with peril, you know. Yeah, I and, understand, and, you man. It seems like a simple answer, but there's a lot of problems you can run into with that simple answer. I get what you mean. Yeah, and then and then there's you know, problems that are uh, some may be foreseen, others unforeseen, uh, but you know. Ultimately, you know what science requires, but I've come to realize that it's not truly science when it comes to Bigfoot that requires all this. It's science bonded to skepticism. Yeah, you're right. Where, where, they, where they they raise the bar to some incredibly high point, and if you cross that point, they raise it higher. You wonder, you know, I'm doing this to try to satisfy something that may not be satisfiable. It, that whatever their reasons are for it, the skepticism seems to be uh, a, a very uh, inflamed and, and, and 
intense skepticism that you can't overcome. So uh, the answers to what level of evidence would it take, uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, it is hard. It is hard. And I think that, you know, the guy that ends up shooting one will become infamous. You know, the guy that killed Bigfoot's going to become infamous. And I don't know that I necessarily want that job, but I think that it needs to be done. I tend to agree with Grover Krantz. I tend to agree with um, John Green. Uh, but you're right. At the end of the day, is that going to be good enough? You know, you just took a life. Is it good enough? And it may not be good enough, you know, for a lot of people. Um, yeah, that's interesting about it being on all fours, kind of running like a rabbit. I don't know that I've heard that before. It's just a really odd thing to see, you know. Uh, I, I, I could not I could not say that I had a match in my mind of, of any other animal except for the rabbit, and that was only in the style that it ran. Uh, it, its back just did not bobble much. You know, it, it just it shot through like a it was submarined through there through that grass. So I, I'm, and that was a you know it was a hundred pounds, but it, it, it was probably. A juvenile. I'm guessing that's what it was, but it it, it could it, if you let your lawn grow up high, it might get by you. You know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I, I want you to think about. I'm going to ask you what I, what you think Sasquatch is, and but I'll give you a chance to kind of think about that. Um, and I want to talk about the um, the white Bigfoot. Uh, the pictures I put up earlier in the week from your website. I'm curious on how you got those, where where did it come from, and what you think it is. And, and if people that check out the Davis Report dot wordpress dot com, uh, it's MK's site, but I've posted them up on Sasquatch Chronicles. I'll also put them underneath this episode. Uh, tell us about this white Bigfoot you captured. Well, this was a few years ago. I, I had my uh, my grandchildren with me, and I decided they were restless, and I decided to just ride. And so I put them in the Jeep, and I, I rode out to this Indian mound that I'd been intending to document and photograph. And I'm interested in Indian mounds uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, but this one particular one had some stories attached to it about uh, some strangeness. And so I was parked there, and, and uh, I'm looking at a photo of it now. Uh, I took some photos of it, uh, and I just kind of cut my camera off and was just sitting there and I looked off to my left and this really strange looking dog uh, it was running and it was loping like a hyena or a giraffe you know it had that loping gait with this long extended neck and I cut my camera back on and it had stopped and I got a picture of it and I'm enamored with this, this dog because I'd never seen one that looked like that I mean it uh, the coloration was familiar. You know, it was kind of a tawny color, but the way it ran was just, you know, really bizarre. Uh, and it took off running back the other way, and I snapped another picture, and then I shot some video, uh, a little short piece. I had to, my camera would do both, so I switched it to video, and uh, it, everything was gone. Then, and uh, I spent the day with my grandchildren, and that that night, I looked at a couple of the pictures. I'm, I'm just looking at the dog. I mean, that's what I what I knew was on them. And and then I I you know they were on my camera for a while. And then the card filled up, and I just uh, saved the entire card to a hard drive, and it just got kind of lost on the in the terabytes, you know. And I was looking for another photo that I I, I couldn't remember where where it was and. And I just came across them. And, and I, I got to look at it and I saw this white thing. But it, I thought maybe, well, it, maybe it's a, you know, a stump or something that's discolored or something. And then I saw it, it had moved. And see, I didn't move. I was, all the pictures were taken from a, a steady place. Uh, I said, whoop, whoop, there's movement there. And I zoomed in and I, Oh Lord, this looks familiar. It's it's a long story about that white bigfoot. If if you could see the other pictures I have of the mound, the mound is right beside a creek, 
And this creek winds up through the hills of the Delta. And it ends up really close to my house. And about five years ago, you might remember the white Bigfoot from Texas. Is that the, the, video. the is that the Why one he, the one where he, he the, shines a light in its face? Is that the one you're talking about? Well, well, that's the same place. But I have another one called Whitey's Run, where a white one runs on all fours. Oh, I do uh, remember that. I do remember that. Yeah, those, are, those are not my videos, but I had been to the place and visited the place. And I came back, and I had these these uh, files. And these files were really impressive audio files that were taken off video that, you know, that was left running all night. And because they were dark, you know, the video really wasn't of any use, but the audio was fantastic. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine in California, and I was saying, you know, you really need to listen to the audio. And he says, well, can you turn it up? Well, I turned it up, and I had, I put it right through a home theater. I played it for him several times, and then I found out, I sent it off to a guy in Phoenix, and he did a, an analysis of it. And he sent me an email back, and he said, okay, there's infrasound on this this audio file. It drops below a certain decibel level. And I had heard skipping, but I thought it was just imperfection. But he said, no, no, that's actually dropping down low. And there's lots of it that, that are in the infrasound. I said, really, you know? Well, it started it started a cascade of events that ended with me capturing some images on a game cam. Three I captured in a row. Uh, it was messing, trying to mess with the camera. But I believe it's that same one. Uh, that's my belief. It, it, it overexposed, but it was so reflective that the light off the camera bounced off of it onto the building. So I knew that it had to be extraordinarily reflective. Either, either it was white or, or it was uh, had a sheen or something. When I found this, I, I, I kind of halfway, but you know, this is not a three and a half miles from there as the crow flies. From so where you, you captured the, figure, you know, it's the same one. Uh, you're you're it, talking about the same, like this, the white one that was jumping around. You're talking about, you think it's the same one as that? Is that what you mean? No, no, no. This is up at my house. Jumping around. No, it wasn't jumping around. Uh, it was messing with the camera. It's, it's, it's a, it started a, a five year odyssey where, I, where I, I walk every day. I walk five miles every day and walk the same route. And I, the next the next day or maybe the second day after I played that file, there were two choked pigs left on the side of the road that had the back of their necks bit out. Their stomachs were torn open to the point where it ripped the hide down one leg and the front legs were pulled up out of the sockets of one of them. And that kind of freaked me out. But the next next day, they were gone. And in their place was a perfectly clean skull, just sitting right where the, 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 the show pigs were. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that really freaked me out. And it began a, a series of animal mutilations that included dogs, uh, possum, raccoons, and had rabbits with their heads torn off, all laid out in, on, in display. So, you know, you see why, you know, I think that this is probably the same one, you know. Um, there's some other things that occurred as well that didn't involve animals, uh, strange things. Um, but I never had any, any strange things at all prior to me playing that file. And I have no idea what, was, what it meant or could have meant but it must have meant something. Yeah, it's fascinating. For the audience who has no clue what we're talking about, I'll post some of the... If you'd send me the Game Camps picks, too, as well, MK, I, I would love to uh, uh, post those. But um, the the white Bigfoot running through, 
I'll post that video too as well. It's pretty impressive. I remember when I first saw it, my knee-jerk reaction was like, oh, that's CGI. But the thing is, when you see these things run or you see these things move in real in real time, it looks fake. I've seen them move. It looks fake. It doesn't look real. Uh, you, I got that video off of a VHS set. Uh, it I was, remember. It, it was it was taken it with early two thousands, you know, big video cameras and, and uh, just video cassette recording. Uh, so it, it 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 was no way that it could be CGI because it was digi- I, I digitized it myself, so I know the chain you know, possession. Yeah, uh, I think you would have been able to pick out CGI pretty quick. Um, yeah, but yeah. You, you, it, 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 was, it was as weird as it looks. Yeah, but you know what I mean, MK. I mean, when you see them move, it almost looks fake uh, in real time. They, it looks fake, and it takes a second for your brain to kind of reset and go, okay, what I'm looking at is real. And then when you film it, like that white Bigfoot you have of it running across, you're just like, oh, my God, can you imagine? I think you called it the loper or something like that. And I remember just because it does kind of have a lope, but it's a very fast lope. Um, and it's probably one of the best videos I've ever seen, and that's exactly how they move. Well, yeah, and, and they'll, they'll surprise you, uh, you know, if you get a good look at one, you know, for an extended period of time, you probably could not believe your eyes. You know, you rub your eyes and do second takes. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. They're very strange. Well, let me ask you, there's a, there's another thing... Um, there's a, there's one I've always wanted to ask you about, and it's the fence climber. And I think you know the video I'm talking about. And for the audience right. listening, I'll post it underneath this episode so you can check it out. But it's this thing climbing over this fence and taking off. Was I wanted to ask you, before you talk about that video, was that the same people that used to film them behind mirrors? They would set up mirrors and then set up their cameras and then... They captured these two things, and, and if I, you have to help me, MK, find it. But they captured these two things like wrestling in the yard, and I was like, "Holy crap! I can't believe they got that." Was that the same guy? You know what I'm talking about? As vague as yeah, that is, yeah. Well, they, <laughs> they they got that. They got that by this is being an observant researcher. Uh, they would try to get reactions out of it. You know, they try to find, they try different things to see if they would react to it or do something. And, and if they did, then they would try to accentuate it by, you know, changing up things. Um, you know, it was just a, a tit for tat type thing. And, uh, you know, these, these guys didn't have any special knowledge of Bigfoot, but I think by the time they'd done this four years, they probably did have special knowledge. But, it, it they they found some tires that somebody had thrown off of a bridge into the woods uh, or a creek and and they noticed the tires being moved, you know, moved around. So what they did was they just took all the tires, brought them to one place, and chained them, and that provoked a reaction. I mean, these things one after they tried to break that chain. Uh, I've got audio files in the nighttime video, not nighttime video, where that you could hear the tires being thrown around, and they were growling, and you know they were trying to break the chains, uh, and so they began to take these tires, and they some of them they painted, they just just tried it, you know, change the colors. Uh, they they took the tires and and hung them up a tree, pretty high up in the tree hoisted them up there and uh, the, the whole tree was torn up. I mean, we just demolished. Uh, so this went on for a while and they, they brought those tires over time closer and closer and closer in to the, uh, to the farmhouse. And I do not recommend this. You know, I don't know what the thinking was because you're, you could be bringing some real trouble in and, what they eventually, you know, threw them over the fence in the back and brought them into the garden and s- drove a steel stake down in the ground and, and, and chained them to that stake. And, and this is what you're looking at there in the fence climber is that it, uh, it's dark 30 and it wants to go to those tires. That's what, that's what it was doing. 
and it ran down that fence line, went through the corn, and then you hear the guinea fowl. You ever heard guineas before? They're real loud. They're like watchdogs. And the guinea fowl began to to sound off, and that it scared it, and it came running back and jumped over the fence. And that's what you see in the fence climb. Yeah, it's strange. It's weird. Well, let's take a listen to one of these. Uh, this is the tire talker. That's creepy audio. Um, and, you know, when you watch a video of it popping over the fence, I mean, it kind of looks like a man, but it doesn't really look like a man. You know what I mean? Kind of your typical. Right. If you, if you, I stood there at that fence, uh, and and at the time, it, it had a top strand that was broke. But, uh, it was like chest high. <laughs> yeah, and that thing in the video just yeah, pop, like... pops right over the top of it like it's nothing. Yeah, it, it it you have to kind of look close. I've got a picture that came that they took us at the same time and same time period uh, with a steel camera, and it shows the little sharper detail. You know the uh, fence lines and stuff. And uh, when it goes down the fence line, you know toward the toward those tires, its back is level with that fence, and that fence is a five strand fence. Yeah, and for the audience, I'll post a video so you can see it for yourself. And it's always impressed me. And the people there, did they ever experience any aggression, MK, that they ever talked to you about as far as these things coming up to the home? Because in a lot of their videos, they almost seem like the creatures are pretty comfortable there. Oh, yeah, they did. As a matter of fact, the lady was afraid of them. She was afraid of them when I was there. You know, all these years later, her husband had died. Uh her husband had been feeding. They had a little, little, they would try to keep them on the property by cooking prepared food and going out there and leaving them on the stumps. But it was her husband that took them out there, not her. So when he passed away, she quit cooking. Because, I mean, she was afraid of, uh, she said that there was one that just would whip the rest of them till they were bloody. And, and there's, you might have seen the video. I call it Tall Paul. It's, got that. it's the same one with the two that are wrestling. If you let it run long enough, uh, I, I have a tendency to clip them so that I, I can work with them without, you know, wearing myself out. But Tall Paul is the one who made those two run off. Uh, he steps out, and he is he is over 10 feet tall. I'm here. I stood there. You know, he is he's big. Uh, and I don't know if he's the one that did all the whipping, but those other two got out of Dodge. I think I remember that. I think I remember them kind of, they were wrestling, and then you see them kind of break off from the fight, and they both kind of scatter in opposite directions. Yeah, they were fighting over those tires. There's, while they were so enamored with those tires, I don't know, but, uh, you know, of all the things that they tried, including food, 
they, those tires were the most coveted item. Is there still activity they, going on on that property today, MK? Yeah, there was there was fresh sign when I went out there. Uh, the lady was afraid, and I, I, you know, I didn't want to say too much about it because I didn't want to get her, you know, uh, scared, you know, into where she was scared to stay home. But there was a top pulled out of a tree, a bent, you know, snapped. And it it was pretty pretty far up this tree. It's a little small tree. And I looked down below and there was this great big track. I didn't want to draw attention to it. She was walking ahead and I just let my camera swing down and film it. And didn't say anything to her. You know, uh you know, you people that are living where and it's not that they're that they're particularly attracted to this one place. It's that they 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 come from another area right old not far from there, and they were they were sort of uh, you know through feeding and conditioning they could be made to come over on there and hang out you know but they they mostly they were from this large acreage across the road that belonged to the National Guard and they didn't allow any trespassing them. So that they were under no pressure whatsoever over them. And they, if, if they would wander out, you know, at night, uh, and, and when it first started, the people who bought this place, they hadn't lived there long and, he liked to hunt for Indian artifacts, you know, arrowheads and the like. And he was finding barefoot tracks and sign out there. And it, it, it kind of puzzled him. And then he read an article where a big, a white Bigfoot had been seen right in that area. It had been reported. And he says, well, that must be what I'm seeing. And so he went and found the guy, but it was his wife that reported it. And it ended up, they worked at the same place, uh, a Kimberly Clark factory there. So they, they began the, uh, the Odyssey. At first, everybody was saying that it, it was hoaxed. They were all hoaxing. And, 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 you know, when you people get together, maybe they, 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 they might be joking or whatever. And, you know, you, you, you scratch your head and you say, I don't want to be the victim of a hoax. So uh, I think they were kind of regarded as a hoax. But uh, when it comes to me, uh, I, I said, well, let's look at your tape. You know, let's let's look at your, your what you got on camera. And we'll see if, they, if that will tell me for sure if you've hoaxed it or if this is something more than a hoax. And, and so... Uh, I had a bucket full of video cassettes. They were uh, six hours long a piece, and there were about 50 of them. It was four years' worth of work. They, they were never intended to, to be publicized. They were, they were shots only for their own edification. I mean, I, I've met these people, um, become friends with them. Yeah, I think so, when you watch the videos, I, I don't know that I would say hoax. I mean, even if I hadn't talking to, if I hadn't spoken with you, uh, if someone said hoax, I, I don't know that I would buy into that because they, they're very fascinating. A lot of those videos that that you had cleaned up and you had posted are very fascinating to watch. A lot of behavior, a lot of um, you know, look like very large creatures wrestling. And for the audience, I'll I'll post up some of those um, under MK's episode. If you go to SasquatchChronicles dot com, I'll post some of those videos. That way, you can make up your mind for yourself. But there's a lot of good videos in there, and I was kind of impressed. I always wanted to ask you, why did they use a mirror? Because what the way they filmed it for the audience listening, um, in a lot of the situations, like the two wrestling. Um, they had a mirror fa- if my memory's right, you'll have to correct me, MK, but they had a mirror facing the front door and then they had a camera looking into the mirror. And so the camera was recording what was actually coming off from the mirror as opposed to just hanging the camera out the window. Uh, why did they do that? Well, they, they, they had, they couldn't get, they couldn't get them to walk in front of the camera. Uh, they could hear them walking all around the camera. 
on the sides and behind the camera, and to the point of even touching the camera, but they couldn't get them to come in front of it. So they they got the idea that we'll take this mirror. They had this big, uh, it was come off a dresser. It's a pretty good size mirror. And, and they started filming into that, and they began to get some really spectacular results. You yeah. know, it, it, uh, apparently they had some idea of what a camera would do. A camera was an eye or something. You know, it looks like an eye. A lot of animals, when you point the camera at them, they'll run because they see that as an eye. And and so perhaps maybe the same there. I don't know. It's, it's speculation, Smart. but uh, Smart, the mirror yeah. thing worked worked very well. It did work well. I was shocked. I was shocked by it. Um, I want to ask you, MK, what, what do you think Sasquatch is? What's your own personal opinion on what Sasquatch is? And obviously, you and I both know we've been doing this for a long time. There's no wrong answer. Uh, but I'm curious, what do you think that they are? I don't think that they're human, even though they have all the tools that we have. Uh, from what I can determine, they're, they possess uh, a density, a mass, that is otherworldly. Uh, they, if you could take a cubic inch of a Sasquatch, and it will weigh about twice what a cubic inch of human, regular, modern man flesh would weigh. Uh, that's why the, their tracks are so deeply embedded. It, it, if a Sasquatch stepped on your foot, it would crush you. It, they, they are not us. They're, they have some of our design, but but they're uh, of a different sort. And uh, I don't think that they're apes either. Are you thinking uh, more of a hybrid? I, I, they might be a hybrid. Uh, I think that they, you know, if I, if I got, you know, just to the nuts and bolts of what I've learned from several really good films. If you look at the Paul Freeman footage, you'll see what I call a true giant or true Bigfoot. And if you look at the Patty film, you'll see a hybrid, uh, one that has some humanity in it. And I got, the reason I believe that is from what the uh, hoopas told me, that they did indeed kidnap women. And at one time, there were 10,000 Chinese in the Buck Creek area mining gold. And they had their families with them, and they were undocumented. And if there were a few true giants in there, they probably left a few hybrids behind. Now. When I say it, it doesn't work every time, if you're talking about they're, they're genetically off from each other, but genetically close enough that occasionally a successful uh, child can be born. But you, you'll have over time, over long periods of time, you'll end up with uh, hybrids mostly. The true giants, uh, the, the Hoopa said the true giants don't live there anymore. They moved away. That's why why Freeman's footage looks different, and they condemned his footage for a long time because it didn't look like the Patterson. But if you look at her, she's uh, she's got very uh, kind of a mixed look with a lot of hair patchy hair. She don't have the hair coverage. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, you're right. You look the, at the free. Yeah, the you the, look at the free the Freeman footage. You know, it's pretty well covered. Yeah, I would agree uh, with you. The the Paul Freeman footage is very different from the Patterson Gimlin. They live a different track too. Uh, Patty's track looks like a, a large version of a human track, although it maybe have some differences. Uh, by and large, it looks like a large version. But if you look at the Paul Freeman track, uh, it's got the the all the toes are shifted forward and they're long and splayed, and 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 during the filming of the creature before he filmed the creature he filmed small tracks that were nine inches long and they were all their toes were forward and splayed as well and so i know it's not a function of weight but a function of design that that the true giants have this type of uh foot and if you see that track they also have bad tempers the the true giants 
uh, have much less tolerance. And if you run into one of them and you're not, you're, you're by yourself, you don't have anyone with you, you best turn around and go back. Uh, the, the hoopa said, if you run into one, you, you talk to it in whatever language that you know. And at the same time, be backing up. And, and the reason for that is that it makes it unsure whether you're by yourself or not. Uh, if you talk to, as if you were with someone, that's the best thing you can do for yourself, especially if you're unarmed. So if you look at the Paul Freeman's footage, he was doing exactly that, even though it was, he wasn't doing it intentionally. Uh, but he was talking out loud to himself. Yeah, it's he's very his... confusing. But you look at that old that that thing, and it stopped and stared at him for a long time. Matter of fact, he lost it in the brush. He couldn't find it. It stared at him when he took off walking again. He realized, you know, he said, "Oh, geez, uh, that it it was considering taking him anyway." But his talking to himself probably bought him his bought his own life. Because the 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 true giants are, are are nasty. They got bad tempers and they're, they're very little tolerance. And so, so you think it, what it, what Paul ran into was a true giant? Is what you're saying? Right, it was a true giant. Uh, you run into the hybrids; they're 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 less likely to hurt you. They uh they have a little they have a little bit of humanity to them, and uh, so they they're they're more likely to just walk away. Uh, and that's that's from from a long, over 25 years of looking into this, that's been my conclusion that if you go to the Bluff Creek area, you're probably not going to find a true giant there. It's, you're going to find mostly these, these clans of these hybrids that are a mix, and they make various levels of mix. And you, that's mostly the tracks that they find. I, I saw all the tracks, the plaster cast that, that uh, Roger Patterson took from Northern California, and they were all black patties. But if you look, get away from there and go into other areas, you see those true giant tracks with those toes all moved forward on the foot. And they call them sausage toes. They're real long. Those, those dudes are bad. Yeah, you just don't need to press them hard. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I always talk about different types. And I know that, like down in the south where you're at, MK, uh, sometimes people run into, this goes off from what you're just talking about, the true giants. But Sometimes people run into what they describe as more of a chimpanzee-looking one, kind of like the one you were talking about that was leaping like a rabbit. They describe a big round head, not really cone-shaped. Um, and, I, you know, the last guest I just had on, you know, the monkey in the tree, he said it reminded him of a chimpanzee sitting up there. His encounter wasn't aggressive, but a lot of those encounters are very aggressive. And the ones that seem to be more like Patty don't quite seem to be quite as aggressive as others. So I, I, I agree with you. I think more of the hybrid, whenever someone says it looked like a human, generally you don't get quite the aggression you do in other cases. Well, that's why that's why they look like humans. It's because they're part human. Uh, not, not to the agreement of the human. Uh, it was forced on them. But, you know, it may take 100 tries for you get a viable you know, a uh, child to actually come to term because they're not genetically the same, but it can happen. Uh, and if you look in uh, David Pilate's book, The Hoopa Project, where he got Harvey Pratt to draw those uh, images, uh, they, and those people signed off on them that, yes, this is what it looked like. They all have that human look to them. And it made a lot of people angry because they're they're kind of locked in on the eighth thing, but it's uh uh it's it what you're looking at there is 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 hard to understand, but the hoopas say that they kidnap their women and occasionally there would be be a child. Over long periods of time, if you've got ten thousand people in there, yeah, yeah, you that you see a lot more of the hybrids there. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Well, MK, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's um, I've always wanted to talk to you. I've always wanted to talk to you about some of these videos. And i got to have you back on the show. I'd love for you to come back. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Would you come back to the show? 
Well, sure I would. I appreciate you having me on. I've got uh, one eight terabyte and two five terabytes worth of material on Sasquatch, and I've got a head full of it and uh, plenty to talk.